Don't go away. Our feature film will begin shortly. Coming soon, to Hastings Mystery Theater. A Night for Crime, it's a 1943 mystery. A dark night in wartime, with several blackouts, it's just a night for murder. Susan Cooper, a fast-talking girl reporter, doubles as amateur sleuth, solving yet another mystery. Hastings Mystery Theater. Where time travel is possible. Come with us as we take you back to a simpler time. Back through the corridors of mystery, to a time when people talk like this? You guys better wise up. I ain't no stool pigeon. And I ain't gonna take no bum rap for dat dame. Dat tomato got herself mixed up with them thugs thinking she'd score a few extra clams. So you gumshoes better lay off. Dem goons dits running to booze or to blame, not me. Don't you see I'm a victim of circumstance? If you think of some more slang words used in the 1930s and 40s, why not share them with us in the comment section? After you've gone and left me crying, after now, gone, here's Randall Schaefer. There's no denying, you feel Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the Corridors of Mystery take us to 1944 for a monogram film, I Killed That Man. A condemned man is led to the death house and asked if he has any last words before he is executed. Many witnesses are eager to see if he will break his silence and reveal who hired him to commit a murder. The condemned man says he intends to talk, but he falls over dead from a poisoned dart before he can say more. The killer must be among the gathered witnesses. An assistant district attorney and a feisty newspaper woman team up to investigate this murder of a condemned murderer. Our stars are Ricardo Cortez and Joan Woodbury, two of Hollywood's most prolific B-movie actors. Ricardo Cortez was born Jacob Kranz in New York City in 1900 and worked on Wall Street for a while when he took up acting, movie producers renamed him Ricardo Cortez to cash in on the Latin lover craze personified by Rudolph Valentino. He worked in films for about 20 years until he realized that he was not ever going to make big money of like the major movie stars did. He returned to Wall Street in the early 1940s where he made his fortune as a stockbroker. He then lived comfortably and died in New York in 1977 at age 76. Joan Woodbury was a Southern California girl born and raised and she got her first acting job at the age of 19. She retired at the age of 30 to devote time to her family. This should be fun. Let's return to 1944 and enjoy I Killed That Man. All right, shooting a buck, boys. How's my friend? Yeah, man. Oh, give me one. Yeah. Beaver. Uh, easy point, boys. Doesn't make. Yeah. Very yeah. easy to make. Yeah. How far am I in? Mm. One mile out. Two dollars. That's it, boys. Snake guys. Good morning, Mr. Reed. Well, Mr. King, I hardly expected to see you here. Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't quite expect to be here myself. I I've never attended a function such as this before, and I... Oh, let me get you a cup of coffee. Oh, I told you this is my lucky day. I have a get in my bones. Come on, now. Come on, hurry up. Come on, I see you go. Looks like you've been persuading him, Bates. Oh, hello, Philip. It's kind of early for an assistant DA to be out of bed, isn't it? Oh, not too early to keep up with you. Oh, well, come on and throw him out and quit talking. Fever. How about you? You want to fade some of this? No, thanks. Never gamble. Give me a cigarette, will you? Sure. Oh, hurry no, thanks. Here, I told you this is my lucky day. Felt like I feel it in my bones. Look, never touch him. 
What's my point? Yes. Schmeiss. Oh, Dylan. My second cup of coffee today. I, I hope it doesn't upset me. <laughs> well, I find it quite stimulating, but uh, not nearly as exciting as this little gathering. In compliance with the laws of this state, you are gathered here to witness the execution of Nicholas Ross. You will file quietly into the death chamber and remain silent in your seats until the order is given to leave. Follow me, please. Nicholas Ross, from the time of your arrest, you have maintained a stubborn silence. This is your last opportunity to speak. Have you anything to say before you pay the penalty for your crime? Yeah, Warden, I've got something to say. Yeah, and I know what you're all thinking. That I'm gonna pull out the stops and bleat that I'm innocent. No, I'm not. Sure, I killed Benton. You reporters have been waiting for me to spill ever since I was nabbed. I disappointed you. But I'm not going to disappoint you now. I'm going out soon, but I'm not going alone. The fellow's going with me squirming plenty now, squirming like I squirmed for nearly a year, waiting for him to spring me. I bet he's dying inside of himself right now, like I died a thousand times. I'm gonna sing, boys, good and loud. He promised to get me out of this if I kept my mouth shut. I've kept my promise, but he welched on his. And now I know he's afraid, like he's always been afraid. I did his killing for him, but he'll have to do his own dying and his own rotting. Benton was going to print a story in the paper that would have broken my boss, so he had me rub him out. Then he gave me the double cross. Now it's my turn. I hand it right back to him. The rat that gave me the nod to kill Benton, the phony big shot I'm talking about is... Doctor, what's the matter? Is he faint? Yellow, huh? He can dish it out, but he can't take it. Quiet, please. Father, I guess you take over from here. What do you mean, Doctor? This man is dead. Heart attack? 
No. Murder. What? Murder? Murder? What do you mean? Quiet, everybody, please. Are you certain, Doctor? Look. See this dart? That's the baby. That did the job. Must be reeking with poison. Look at the dilation of the pupils. Boy, what a story. Yeah, what yeah. Just a minute, Bates. No hurry. God, cover the door. Nobody is to leave this room. What, what do you mean, no hurry? With 200,000 readers waiting and you say no hurry, then you don't know the Chronicle and my boss. Because if this isn't out in the street in the next edition, then I'm back on the lobster trick. And you know what that means, don't you? Or do you? A little night work won't do you any harm, Bates. Gentlemen. All line up along the wall, please. You don't oh, mind, you yeah, wardens. Yeah, it's yeah. a good thing you were here to take over. I got to get back to my sheet. Yeah, I got come a on, put your hands. I got a broadcast to do. Well, no one can say that you weren't on the job this time. On the spot, you mean, warden? I was watching him very carefully. That dog traveled with a lot of speed. It was shot out of something, and we're here to find out what that something is. Shot out of something? What do you mean? You're talking about? Stop quiet, boys, please. If you keep on making noise, you won't be able to hear me. And if you don't hear me, you won't know what I want. And you're going to stay here until you do. Come on, Sherlock. It's too bad we don't have our cameras with us to take pictures of the great mystery unraveling. That might be very amusing. Gentlemen, please take your clothes off, all of you. What? What, 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 what is the meaning of this? That's precisely what we're going to find out. Foley, frontery. Why should I be subjected to this sort of thing? And this man, who is he? This is Roger Phillips, district attorney's office. I suggest that you gentlemen cooperate. Oh, I, I'm very sorry, Mr. Uh, Phillips. That's quite all right, quite all right. You just follow instructions. Yes, of course. I didn't listen to my old lady. She told me to change my socks. This is absolutely infantile. Who ever heard of a crime being solved this way? Well, you ought to see more double features. What's that to do with our undressing? Well, don't you get it? One of us has the murder weapon, and Phillips, the smart Alec, thinks we have it hidden between our toes or something. Most embarrassing. So you be absurd. Hey, wait a minute. What about you two guys? What do you mean? Well, if I'm sitting in a game of strip poker, and the stakes are this high, Everybody plays or I don't. He's right. It's the first time I ever knew anybody on the Times had brain. Start disrobing, Mr. Phillips. There's been a murder committed in this room, remember? I suggest that you start with your tie. I agree with you, Bates, 100%. You're absolutely right, Johnson. Looks like we're sitting in, Warden. Yes. Hey, boss, I got that raw yarn finished from birth to burial. Shouldn't I run the exact time that they throw the switch? Naturally, that's what sells papers. A fellow reads the time and remembers that he was drinking his orange juice then. Gets a big kick out of it. Orange juice? That reminds me, I haven't had my coffee yet. Give me the exact time and I'll rush this down for a galley proof. Well, that's peculiar. Should have heard from Bates by now. Half hour. Usually they run these things right on schedule. Here's last night's interview with the new shooting star of cinema. Movies to you. Movies with you? It's a date. Cut the cross, talk. Get me the state prison. Making a reservation so soon? Shh. This is Miller of the Chronicle. I want to talk to Warden Cummings. I can't reach the Warden, sir. He hasn't retired from the death chamber. And perhaps you can tell me or find out what time Bates of the Chronicle left. He's covering the Ross execution for the paper. If that's the case, sir, then he must also be in the death chamber. They've been in there nearly half an hour. Something big. Something big. Locate Bates? They're holding him in the death chamber. Oh, they finally caught up with him. You're just the girl. Will it get me raised? How's your contact with the DA's office? Still functioning? Still romancing, you mean. Platonic, my friend. Purely platonic. Platonic? He must be crazy. Maybe I have a lot of sales resistance. Will you stop this advice to the lovelorn stuff? Now look, Jerry. If anyone knows what's happened up there, or what's happening, it's the DA's office. Can you find out? Well, I'll go down trying. What's it about? You see, uh, he advised me for my brain, and I don't want to disappoint him. What's it about? Don't you read the papers? Occasionally, but I don't always believe what I read to you. Nick Ross killed Benton. Oh, yes, the uh, cub reporter from the news. I know that much. Go Got on. Got a first degree rap. Made two appeals. Everything looked fine for him up until the last minute. Then they were turned down. He was supposed to get the chair at eight this morning. That's all we know. Why, anything might have happened up there. Maybe a last minute delay waiting for the governor to act. Anything else? No, except a little appreciation for my good work. Could you repeat the number, please? Thank you. Lines busy. No wonder there's such a little thing as wrong numbers. Oh, hello, Miss Reynolds. Don't you know that half the calls people make aren't important? So if they don't get them, so what? How do you know so much about the calls people make? Simple. I listen in like the letter carrier in the postcard. Don't say so. You tell Mr. Phillips I'm here? Can't. 
Don't tell me you have to finish that chapter. Nope, he isn't in. I'll wait. Sure, have a chair, then nail down. Say, that's a cork new jacket you've got. When'd you get it, yesterday? Still a super sleuth, aren't you? How'd you figure that one out? Oh, look at the collar. That one's pressed round, the others are flat. Deduction, obvious. You just put it on today and that little tail around the corner hasn't had a chance to put his mark on it. <laughs> You're wonderful. Say, I'll tell you something else. You got dressed in a hurry this morning. Don't tell me you were peeking. Ah, that's for amateurs. You got your left stocking on inside out. You're marvelous, but you'd better stick to collars. Isn't he in about this time? Mm, he's up at the state prison right now, attending that Nick Ross barbecue. Just sent me a message. Message? What did the message say? Nothing. Only he wouldn't be in until later. Hey, where are you going? To prison. Oh, what some women won't do for a man. Bates, I have never seen such a collection of phone numbers. But you ought to see who answers. You know, Mr. Phillips, if you're lonesome some night and want a partner for solitaire, I might let you have a number or two. Thank you, no. Back to your seat. Never have I been so humiliated. Felt kind of foolish myself. I guess I'll have to go on a diet. <laughs> so I noticed. Mr. King. Yeah? Thank you very much for cooperating. I believe these things are yours. Yes, thank you. Oh, uh, my capsules, I, I don't know what I'd do without them. Nervous indigestion, you know. I've tried all sorts of remedies. Exercises, too. Oh, nothing too strenuous, but do help me in the least. Uh, and then my physician prescribed these. If ever you're... Oh, uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I could eat a great big steak right now. A steak? <laughs> Just think. Boiled chicken upsets me. You'd better try two of those capsules next time. But by the way, just why are you here today, Mr. King? I'm Mr. Lowell King. Well, it sounds euphonious, but that's all. Mr. King is here at the invitation of the governor, Mr. Phillips. Oh, I see. He has been offered an appointment to the State Board of Pardons and Paroles and is making a survey of the state prison prior to accepting the vacancy. I hope that you don't have many occasions of this sort. Thank you, Mr. King. Yes, I quite agree with you, and thank you. That'll be all. Garvey. I'm Garvey. Evening dispatch. Can I scram now? I got a deadline made. Plenty of time for the evening dispatch. Not this evening dispatch. It comes off in the morning. You'd better stick around a few minutes. It might be worthwhile. Mr. Lanning. I believe these things are yours. Mr. Lanning, just why are you here today? Uh, uh, Nick Ross asked for me. Got me a pass. Why? Oh, I don't know. I guess I'd do it that. I've known Nick ever since he was a kid. I had a candy store. He used to come in with his penny. Nice kid. Uh, didn't see any bad in him then. Warden, did Nick Ross send for him? He did. Mr. Lanning, do you still have a candy store? Well, uh, no, I'm sort of retired. I made a nice real estate deal some time back, and I'm fairly comfortable. Did you ever help Nick Ross out as a kid? I told you he was a good boy. Uh, even used to run errands for me. I always brought back the right change. He certainly changed all right. All he ever brought back later on was the right body. Thank you, Mr. Lanning, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Reed. Why are you here today, Mr. Reed? It's my duty to my membership. I'm executive secretary of the Union Against Capital Punishment. I attend all executions and report all the details to my organization. Quite a job. That'll be all. Johnson? Yeah, yeah, I'm Johnson. At the time. Leave these things are yours? Yeah. Oh, uh, are these yours, too? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're mine. I never knew you were an art critic. <laughs> Just breaking them in for a friend. Now, gentlemen, I want you to take the exact places you were in at the time of the murder, please. Be seated, please. Now, Nick Ross was standing in about this spot when he was hit. Is that right, Warden? That's right, Mr. Phillips. I see. Bates. What now, Dr. Watson? Would you mind stepping over there, please? I'm trying to figure something out. Not me, brother. Not on that spot. You aren't frightened by any chance? No, no, no. Just cautious. There's still a murderer in this room, remember? And I don't believe that stuff about lightning that's striking twice in the same place. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lanning, would you mind stepping over there, please? Uh, over there? Yes, please. And don't mind the lightning. 
Mr. Bates is very superstitious. Well, if it means helping to find the murderer, I'll stand there. Thank you very much. That's it, right there. Right mm -hmm. here. Gentlemen, you're sure you're in the same place? What is it, the game of musical chairs? Who was sitting here? The case is solved, gentlemen. Science is infallible. You were sitting there, sweetheart. Oh, yes, of course, of course. So I was. Uh-huh. Why did you kill Nick Ross? Who? Me? I didn't. You did, Lanny? Why? I didn't. I swear I didn't. I was sitting over there like all the others. You told me you didn't smoke, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Never touch him. Mr. Lanning, the cigarette holder was found in the pocket of your coat. It's yours, isn't it? Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, oh, yes. That's right. It is. I see. That's better. It is yours, isn't it? But it's not. What do you mean? First it's yours, then it isn't, and now it's not. Well, you see, it's like this. It's, it's my daughter's. That is, it was my daughter's until I took it away from her. She came home late last night, and she was smoking with it like a loose woman, and I took it away from her. I like to keep an eye on her. She's a good girl, but I want to watch it. Same as any father. How old is your daughter? Uh, she'll be uh, 26 next July. You mean to stand there and tell me that you took a cigarette holder away from a woman of 26? Uh, she's not a woman to me, Mr. Phillips. She's my baby. This sounds like a bedtime story to me. You mean to stand there and tell me that Nick Ross invited you here just because he bought candy in your store and ran errands for you? Uh, there's more to it than that. I was a character witness at his trial. Uh, I even wrote a letter to the governor. Nick was a good boy until he got mixed up with the wrong crowd. Maybe that's why he wanted me here. I remember at the trial, the first one, when he said to me, gee, it's good to have you here. And then I reminded him of the time when when the only racket he'd ever heard of was a tennis racket. And he laughed. A sad kind of a laugh. Character witness, huh? Wrote the governor. And I suppose you told Nick Ross all about this. Uh, yes, I did. When I visited him once. How did you know? Because you did it to show him that you were trying to spring him. Now I know why Nick invited you here. So he could put the finger on you. But you beat him to the punch. Lanning, you're guilty of murder and I'm placing you under arrest. He's in your charge. Can we go, Come on, teacher? Let's go, go, boys, go ahead. Don't forget the DA's office, always on the job. What a story. What a story. Boy, we really get to get What's the matter? What's the Bates, 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 what's happened? Would you gentlemen be available as witnesses, inasmuch as you both sat beside him? Delighted. I shall even be available for the execution, which no doubt will be the aftermath. No doubt. And you, Mr. King? Oh, it's a sorry affair to be a party to. But uh, you may rest assured that I'll be at your service. And may I offer my congratulations on the splendid manner in which you handled everything? Mm, thank you very much. Uh, where can I reach you by phone? Uh, I'll give you my private telephone number. You can reach me at the office of the Union for the Abolition. Yes, I know. Capital punishment. Thank you very much. Here it is. That's fine. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, sir. And you stick around, get yourself a follow-up. Who's wrong? Phillips, he can tell you plenty. He usually does, but why more this time? Because he's the lad who made the pinch. Oh, well, where can I find him? Raj! Raj! Hello. Fancy meeting me here. Isn't one from the Chronicle enough on a story? I bet you could tell me a lot you wouldn't tell Bates. Ah, but I'm not going to, Dress Hours. Now, be a good little pal. I'll wait, I'll wait. That's fine. There's a nice, big, comfortable chair in there, and I guarantee it'll put you to sleep. You're just a no for a sweet one, though. Who's he? Do you know him? Mr. Lowell King. He has dyspepsia and a mole on his right thigh. What have you got, an x-ray eye? Mm -hmm. And me with my stocking on backwards. <laughs> Pardon me, aren't you Mr. King, Mr. Lowell King? Why, yes, I... Uh, what can I do for you? Don't you remember me? No, I, I'm afraid I... Uh, where have we met? Can we go where uh, there aren't so many, uh, shall I say, ears? But my dear young lady, I, I scarcely know you. Oh, a rapidly friendship ripens. A moment ago, you didn't think you knew me at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
And this is conclusive proof that the district attorney's office is functioning properly and alertly in the upholding of the law. And there is no doubt that they will press the murder charge against Michael Lanning to a successful conclusion. There you are. The newspapers say he's guilty. The radio says he's guilty. And you say he's innocent. What did you study law out of? Blackstone or the pulp magazines? Do you know what this is going to mean when we let him go? Who said anything about letting him go? Are you insinuating I'd permit an innocent man to be tried for murder just because of some stupidity of yours? Now, please, Chief, please, watch your blood pressure. I'm not insinuating nor hinting. When Lanning goes out of there, someone else is going in, the real murderer. Then why not arrest him now? How can I when I don't know who it is or what it is? A fine mess. It'll ruin me. Why should they blame you? And why are you so certain he isn't guilty? He was in that room, wasn't so he? Was I. And that cigarette holder. Don't tell me that isn't damaging evidence. Not when everybody on the street heard him take the cigarette holder away from his daughter. Uh, why did you do this to me? Now, Chief, look. We'd be a fine pack of saps if I witnessed a murder in a locked room and couldn't find the murderer. Don't say we. I wasn't in that room. Well, anyway, I'm holding one temporarily. In the meantime, the real murderer. Yeah, the real murderer. He'll just hang around, wait for you to nail him, thinking the whole case has been settled. Listen, Roger, this is serious. Someone is guilty. And we haven't enough evidence on Lanning to convict him. Is he in? Yeah, but he's busy with the chief. Now I'll go into his office and wait. You do, and he'll toss you out. He's working on that Lanning case. Hmm, what a coincidence. So am I. You are, so am I. Only I got it soft, see? Now look, Lanning is no more guilty of that murder than Phillips in there is. I say, here's my theory. Who said it was murder? Now tell me, who said it was murder? I think he killed himself. Nick Ross, oh, how could he possibly? I'm working on that right now. Look. This stuff is going to your head instead of your brains. What'll they write next? Why don't you go to the library and find out for yourself? I don't want to be disturbed by anyone. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Except Dr. Williams at the state prison. Shall I ring you before I send him in? No, why? Nothing. Oh. Oh, no wonder he was so anxious to announce Dr. Williams. Hi, you're a busy man. When do we ever get a moment alone together? This is it, darling, so you better take advantage of it. I will. <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh. Now that the immunities are over, let's get down to business. Look, Rog, I've got a typewriter over at my office that's just begging to knock out a hot yarn on the landing case. When do we indict him? We're not, and it's off the record. If one syllable breaks anywhere... I know, you'll break my neck. What's happened? Nothing, that's just it. I had as much on base to pinch him as I did Lanny. It was just as simple for him to blow the dart. With what, hot air? No, oh, he had a pipe. Bates had a pipe? Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Maybe Tommy was right. He said Lanning wasn't any more guilty than you. Tommy? Oh. Tommy, how did you come out of your interview with King? How did you know? How did I know? Didn't I sick you onto him? Or do you think for a minute that I was trying to get out of buying you your lunch? Do you blame me? First you stand me up for breakfast, and then you push me onto someone else for lunch. Did he take you to lunch? Luncheon, if you please. Sterling silver coffee service and everything. And I didn't have to go Dutch or leave a tip. Mm -hmm. What did you have to eat? I mean, what did he have? You going in for studying diets? Oh, tell me, Jerry, how does he eat, like a man or a mouse? Well, I'd say more like a mouse. He had a carrot salad and a glass of milk. Oh, then he has got dyspepsia. Oh, every symptom. So I didn't learn anything about Mr. King, but what's his ailments got to do with the case? Well, you know. Be suspicious of everyone. That's the first rule. The last rule that counts when you count up. Rog, you've got yourself in a spot. Now, Jerry, don't be redundant. The Chief's been hopping on that all morning. Do you want to help me, Jerry? It may lead up a blind alley. If there's a story in it, just say the word. Then Laverne Drake. Oh, sure. Nick was his girl. I got two columns out of her the day after Nick was arrested. That's three more columns than we got. I've got a job for you. Is it permanent and can I have every other Wednesday off the club night? We'll discuss that later and preferably in the moonlight. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounds so nice. But before the moonlight, I'm to interview Vern Drake, to put it mildly. To put it strongly, I'm to pump her till she says anything that might mean anything. You know something, Jerry? You should wear a badge and have flat feet. That's exactly what I want. I'll give you her address. Here's the laboratory report. Hmm. Garrari. Sounds deadly enough. I never heard of it. It's a rarely used poison. Just a scratch and the victim stiffens suddenly and collapses. When it enters the bloodstream, death is instantaneous. Should be simple enough to trace where it was bought. A rare poison like this isn't apt to be found on every druggist's shelf. 
And this one happens to be. It can be bought almost anywhere without a prescription. Properly compounded with certain other drugs, it's often used in the treatment of certain organic diseases. You seem to know quite a bit about poison, Doctor. Four years of pre-med, six years of medicine, two years of interning, and two years of prison medicine. Don't you think I ought to know something? Oh, yes, of course. Certainly. Thank you very much, Doctor. Of course, I'll need your expert testimony at the trial. Naturally. Thank you. What do you want? Hello, I'm Jerry Reynolds. How are you? Not so good. Oh, I remember you. <laughs> Little gal that mooched in here like a long-lost friend with a kind of a shoulder you like to spill things to. The next thing I knew, I was all the front pages. Go on, get out oh, Wait a minute, Fern, you're just upset. You're excited. Don't burn me. You don't know me that well. <laughs> Who wouldn't be excited? So would you if you hadn't slept for two days, knowing that every minute slipping by was taking the only fellow that ever did anything for you. I'm Nick Ross's girl. That's who I am. We were going to get married and have a home and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I know, Vern. I know all about it. Yeah. I suppose you do know. Say, what do you want? To make it still tougher for me? You haven't read the papers, have you? No. I'm not going to read the papers. I'm never going to read the papers. I don't need a headline to tell me Nick died in the chair. But he didn't. You mean they sprung him? You mean his pardon came through? No, Vern, I don't mean anything like that. Nick was murdered in the death chamber just before the execution. Murdered? You never could figure, Nick. Always the unexpected. Who did it? We don't know, Vern. We hoped you could help us out. How could I help? Well, if I even had a hunch, do you think I'd be sitting here talking to you? Think hard, honey. There must be something you can pin a clue to. I don't know anything about Nick or the way he treated me. And I'll never forget it. He never broke any of my laws. He always played straight with me. He must have had some business associate, or, or maybe somebody had it in for him. Only the cops. But Nick wasn't afraid of them. Not Nick. He wasn't afraid of anybody. About his business or the way he made his money, I never asked any questions, and... Well, he always kept the answers to himself. Did any of his friends ever call in him here? No. Nick steered him clear of here. Did anyone ever make any phone calls here? Did he call anyone? Yeah. Yeah, he called somebody once. <laughs> I asked him what he was about. He told me to mind my own business. Gee, he sure got sore on me that night. Who did he call? What was the number? Do you remember it? Yes. I watched him dial. I thought he might be calling a girl. What was it? One of those combinations you never could forget. 1313. Double bad luck. The next morning the cops broke in and arrested him for that Benton killing. What was the, the exchange? The telephone exchange? I only watched the number dialed. Anyway, who could ever tell an exchange from watching somebody dial a phone? Well, do you remember any of the conversation? Oh, only that the guy at the other end was holding out. Didn't want to pay him or something. Nick got mad and hung up, that's all. So, honey, that may be enough. Now, listen, you take my advice, Fern. Don't you leave this apartment under any conditions so you can hear from me. Say, are you trying to get me to hang around here until the cops get here to question honey, no me? no cops are going to question you. I promise you that. Now, stay here until you hear from me, will you? Keep your chin up. But with a noose. And all I want you to do is to announce us to Phillips. Just announce us. Look, how many times must I tell you that Phillips is blind today? He hasn't seen anybody, so why should I wear out the switchboard announcing you for us? Will you tell Phillips we're here? We're members of the press. And an eager public is awaiting the dictum of your illustrious master. That double talk stuff went out a long time ago. It's corny. And I've got one on my foot that would like to know you a lot better, buddy. Yeah. We've got to get into him. This landing case is news, and we haven't any. Landing case? Yeah. Well, why don't you fellas say so? I can give you the lowdown on that. Huh? You? Sure. Listen, landing isn't guilty at all, see? What do you mean? Now, look. I got a theory Nick Cross wasn't even murdered, see? Yeah. The fella in the death chamber was a double for him. You know, like the stand-in in pictures. How did you figure that one out? This book. Oh, he reads. Famous dual personalities in crime from Jekyll to Hyde by Inspector Smith. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little bit screwy, aren't you, bud? <laughs> screwy, am I? Listen, you fellas are so smart. You're sitting out here right now angling in a way to get into Phillips' office, aren't you? Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, if I was out there and there was another fella at the switchboard, I'd kind of slip my dollar, see? And the fellow might get kind of thirsty and he'd want to go out for an ice cream soda. And when he was out, well, I'd kind of duck in. Simple? Hey, that's not oh, a bad oh, idea. Let me, fellas. Here's a dollar that isn't doing anything but keep me warm. Well, well, Mr. Bates, thank you very much. You always did look like Santa Claus to me.
Hey, wait a minute. How about that ice cream soda? Ice cream soda? Yeah, yeah, the ice cream soda. Yeah. Oh, the ice cream soda. Oh, well, that was if I'd be outside and there'd be another fellow at the switchboard, but uh, I'm at the switchboard and I'm allergic to ice cream. <laughs> you have been oh, taken, my friend. No, fellas, let me. <laughs> This is a friend of yours. If you've got any sense, you'll leave town right away. Who is it? Get out of town and stay out, and don't be shooting your mouth off to reporters, or you'll get the same treatment your boyfriend got. Bye. Hello? Hello? Operator. Operator, I just received a telephone call. Will you trace it, please? Sorry, it's impossible. Shall I connect you with this supervisor? No. No, never mind. Drake. It's very important that I see you here right away. But that's impossible. I can't get away right now. Oh, yes, you can, or else I'll come over and get you. Oh, don't do that. I'll be there in an hour. I'll be waiting, but only for an hour. Hello, boys. Hello, hello. hello. Still holding down the fort, huh? <laughs> hello. hello, Sherlock. Hey, what does she think she is, the Panzer Division? Hey, why did you let her in? Mr. Phillips orders. Well, why is she any different than we are? Mr. Bates, don't you think you should ask your mommy that question? Go on, what else did you find out besides the number of rooms in her place? That she doesn't like policemen. Come on now, come on. There's something more important behind those twinkling eyes. There is a telephone number, 1313. Jerry, pardon me if I seem a little dull, well, but... Well, in all the time Nick Ross spent at her apartment, he only made one telephone call, and the number he dialed is 1313. What exchange? I couldn't find out. I wish I was good at these quizzes. So do I. Tommy, tell investigation I want a list of all telephone numbers 1313. The name of every exchange and every subscriber. Right. Ross, before you waste any more time, may I suggest you send someone over to keep a tab on that Drake girl, and you never can tell what might happen. Good idea, Jerry. Send Collins in, Tommy. Collins. Yeah, Mr. Phillips wants to see you. Okay. Don't tell me he's any different. Yeah, he wears garters. How does he know he wears garters? Don't ask him. He knows everything. Collins, Nick Ross's girl, Vern Drake, lives at 69 East Boulevard. Apartment 6. I want you to get a complete report on what she does and where she goes. Right, sir. What did you say that number was? I mean the telephone number. 1313. 1313. Where have I seen that number before? Here it is. Pathway 1313. Oh, this is Lower King's number. He wrote it down for me himself this morning. Oh, Rog, what a story. Now, take it easy. Don't get excited. Take it easy. We'll check on this lad. One swallow doesn't make a drunk, you know. And one telephone call doesn't make a murderer. Especially if he looks like King. Here it is, Lowell King, Groton, Harvard, University Club, Metropolitan Club, National Yacht Club, President and Chairman of the Board of the King Appliance Company. It's amazing, no wonder he has dyspepsia. I wouldn't take him for a murderer. Neither would I. Uh, Tommy, come in a moment, please. Say, you're not suspecting King, are you? Well, I don't know. I don't oh, know. <laughs> he's not the type to do his own washing or his own killing. Doesn't that impression rather gel with what Nick Ross said about the big shot who wasn't the type to do his own killing? Yes, Mr. Phillips. Well, Tommy, file this on the witnesses, landing case. Yes, sir. You're losing your grip, not witnesses, suspects. Don't let your imagination take you for a ride. Well, say, Mr. Phillips, what do these numbers mean back here? What numbers? It might be a quote or something. Once I read you the You read too much. I don't know, it might be a stock quotation or a Chinese telephone number. What do you make of it? It's funny, I seem to know, and yet I don't. It's right on the tip of my memory, too, that combination. I don't know, I give up. Oh, don't worry, I'll figure it out. It's a cinch, just like that crossword puzzle. Don't forget, 
I gave you the four-letter word. Now go on about your business. <laughs> Kings Colleges and Clubs frighten you off? Definitely. Where are you going? I'm going to pay a little visit to Mr. Lowell King. Oh, just rehearsal for your star witness, huh? My little plum, it's only a short step from the witness chair to the prisoner's dock. You never can tell. What's cooking, Phillips? Nothing new on the landing case. We're preparing an indictment. Mr. Phillips? Yes? Investigation just called. They said they'll have the dope for you in a little while. Fine. See you later, Jerry. Going back to the paper? If you pay the cab. With pleasure. No backseat driving? I wouldn't fool you. <laughs> All right. I'd like to see Mr. King, please. Who shall I say is calling? Mr. Phillips, District Attorney's office. When you come in, please. Yes, Gordon. There is a Mr. Phillips from the District Attorney's office here to see you, sir. Mr. Phillips? Oh, yes. Thank you, Gordon. Well, Mr. Phillips, this is an unexpected visit. Sure. Come right in. Won't you sit down, please? Thank you. Well, I scarcely expected to see you so soon, especially after that unfortunate episode. What can I do for you? You might be of some service. Well, as I've already said, you can count on me. But I hardly think I could be of any assistance to you, especially after the masterful way you caught Lanning. Quite an accomplishment, quite. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. King, how well did you know Nick Ross? Know him? <laughs> Not at all. Knew of him, yes. Merely the things that one reads in the newspapers. Most undesirable characters, I recall. Then why did he telephone you on the day that Benton was killed? Telephone me? It's preposterous. Just what are you trying to say, Mr. Phillips? That Nick Ross telephoned you on that day. Your telephone number is Pathway 1313, is it not? Yes, yes, that's my number. Mm -hmm. It's beyond my comprehension. You must be mistaken. I can assure you I'm not. Just, uh, what is the source of this misinformation? Nick Ross's sweetheart was with him at that time but I can't understand what... Just a moment. You rang, sir? Yes, Gordon. Tell me, do you ever know a person named Nick Ross? Yes, I did, sir. I occasionally placed a small wager with him on the horses. Gordon, you know how I object to gambling. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. But it wasn't often that I wager it, sir. Only a small bet once in a while. Did he ever telephone to you here? Only about to pay off. When I won. Which, unfortunately, wasn't very often. I can quite understand that. Are there any questions you would like to ask, Mr. Phillips? None, thank you. That will do, Gordon. I'd like to have a word with you later. Yes, sir. I wouldn't be too harsh with him. But I don't quite know what to do about it. In, in my own home, that's the disgraceful part of it. It's quite a popular pastime, you know. But there's no telling what that sort of thing might lead to. Imagine having someone in one's employ who had dealings with such a character as Nick Ross. Why, it's most upsetting. I'm sorry to have troubled you, Mr. King, but, as you know, it's a rule of our office to run down every clue, no matter how trivial. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I quite understand that. Thank you, and goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Phillips.
It's about time you got here. I have some people in the office. I thought I told you never call me there. You told me lots of things, but now I'm telling you something. I want that money back and I want it right now. But I haven't got it. It's been used. Listen, you came to me and told me you could spring Nick. You gave me all that dribble about connections. We scraped up $5,000 for you, now you scrape it back. Uh, it's impossible, I tell you. I haven't got it. What did you do with it? You don't seem to understand, my dear. That money was a contribution to the Union Against Capital Punishment to further our good work and our efforts. Don't give me that. You're the Union and there's nobody else. Listen, you fake. Do I get that money or do I call the district attorney's office? Just a minute, Mr. Drake. Please, don't be so impetuous. Do I get it? Yes. I meant to give it to you all the while. Of course, I can't give it to you right at this very minute. I mean, it'll take a few days to make the necessary arrangements. I'm not interested in your arrangements. All I know is that I have a reservation on the 8.30 plane out of here and I'm using it. Oh, so you're leaving town? Yes. Why? Well, because the climate around here isn't exactly good for my health. And unless you shell out, it won't be good for yours. I see. Sort of an emergency, eh? Well, in that case, I think I can get a considerable part of the money. I'll go right down to my safety deposit box and return immediately. You can go to your safety deposit box, but you don't have to bother returning because I'm going with you in my car. I don't want you picking up the wrong road map and getting lost. Come on. examination, Collins. We couldn't find a mark on her that caused her death. Tell me, did you see anybody touch the car? I know. I was here all the time. Oh, say, wait a minute, Mr. Phillips. When the car crashed, the horn was blowing. So I had a fellow lift the hood and cut it off. Hook it up again, please. piece of steel was sticking it. When did the horn start blowing, Mr. Reed? Just before the crash, when Miss Drake pressed it to warn some pedestrians. How did that get in there, Mr. Phillips? Perhaps Mr. Reed can tell us. I don't know what you mean. Well, we talk about that later. Take him on in, boys. You can't do this to me. Come on, get back. Come on, get back. Come on. Mr. Reed, where were you going in that car? I told you we were merely going for a ride. You mean she was? There's no law to say I must be subjected to this. You can't do this to me. Come, come, please be original. Why were you running away when Collins grabbed you? A fine gentleman. The moment you get into an accident, you tail off, huh? Mr. Phillips, I... I know all this may seem very incriminating, but... But you see, I, I wanted to avoid any sensational publicity. I occupy a very important position. Not important enough that you didn't lower yourself to grab $5,000 for a vague promise to spring Nick Ross, hmm? That sum was a contribution to our organization in its fight against capital punishment. I wouldn't make that plural if I were you. I've checked on you. And the only thing union about it is the connection between you and the bank account. The affairs of my organization and the good work that we do is not to be so lightly disregarded. 
Besides, I... I don't believe that has anything to do with this matter at all. Mr. Reed, Vern Drake was murdered. You are aware of that fact, are you not? Impossible. Murder, Firefall. I don't believe it. Why, I was sitting right beside her. That's why I'm booking you for murder. Logical, isn't it? You killed her, Reed, with a sliver of steel. You concealed it in the horn button. On it was the same poison that killed Nick Ross. That's why I'm holding you for that killing, too. But I tell you I didn't. Why should I? I'm a district attorney, Mr. Reed, not a mind reader. And I'm quite certain that I'll find the correct motives. Take him down, boys. This way, Mr. Reed. You know, Jerry, I feel like a triple stepchild up there at that DA's office ever since Philip stumbled over that ankle of yours. About the only way I know what goes on in that place is to read the papers. Stop harping on it. You started with the salad, now you're down to the coffee. Bates, nothing goes on up there that you don't know. But there's one thing you can't kid me about. Phillips is after someone. Now, who is it? You know what you're talking about, because I don't. Sure, I heard Tommy tell Phillips that investigation was about to nab someone. Tommy said that. Sure, he said investigation called and would have the dope for Phillips in a little while. Now, what I want to know is, who is the dope? <laughs> you. The dope Tommy referred to was a routine checkup on a telephone number. That ought to be right up your line. I stuck my chin out for that one. So let's get back to the paper. Just pay the check and let's go. Well, that's why he invites me to dinner, so we get some information. I... Did you say pay the check? Well, lest you, my friend, you invited me to dinner. But, darling, this is your party. And I'm a firm believer in the laws of equality as far as women are concerned. If they want to vote, they've got to pay. More conclusive is my bankroll. One dollar. Six eighty-five. No wonder he eats so well. Well, I've got two dollars and twenty-five cents. My friend and colleague, I see a nice big stack of soapy dishes facing us. Come on, roll up your sleeve. Not as long as you can write a check. Well, why can't you write a check? Because my arm is broke and so is my bank account. <laughs> I lose. There you are. Hello. Yeah. Cash check for me? Do I know you? I don't know, do you? No to both questions. Look, pal, I'm not asking you any questions. All I want you to do is cash a small check for me. I might even do the same for you sometime. The boys that cash these checks here promise to do the same thing for me sometime. I get it. Thanks, pal. I'd sure be insulted if I were you. They wouldn't even cash your check. That's what I get for keeping bad company. What do we do now? That's what I'm trying to figure out. How does anybody think of that music going on? I've got an idea, babe. The Marines have landed. What can I do for you? How about changing this into four quarters, huh? Well, that's a deal that I will go for. Thank you, Al.
Miss Reynolds, what are you doing here? Looking for someone just like you to save me. Why, what's the matter? Well, the trouble is, I was under the impression that I was being taken to dinner. Yes? I was being taken, all right, but not to dinner. I'm stuck with the bill and they won't cash my check. Oh, how much is it? Ten dollars. Ah, oh, hello, Mr. Kane. I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. How do you do? Well, I see that they cash your check all right. They know me rather well here. You know, I'm really becoming very, very fond of you. Well, that's very, very nice. Joe. See that they cash this young lady's check, please, and tell Mr. Garrick that I said it was all right. Yes, sir. Take my advice. Goodbye. Come in. Boss, I got a check here from Mr. King. He said you would cash it. Yes, give it to me. It's all right. Okay, boss. Yeah, Mr. King. Oh, thank you, Garrick. Come on, have a heart, will you? I'd much rather have a receipted bill, thank you. Oh, permit me, please. Oh, Mr. King, you really... Come on, leave him alone. What do you want to do, frustrate him? Come on, let me have a couple of dollars, will you? I'm due for a hit, I can feel it in my bones. Well, you'd better see a doctor. Come on, we're going back to the paper. I'll settle for a quarter. Well, hurry up and lose it. Oh, uh, I'd be glad to drop you both off if you're going back to your paper. Perhaps you have your car here. On our salary? All we can afford is rubber heels. So stick around, we'll be with you as soon as I hit that jackpot. It won't take very long, Mr. King. Sorry, bud. Wait a minute, pal. Have some on me. Remarkable, cracking the case like that. Now I hope you'll appreciate me and not run off to dinner with fellows like Bates. <laughs> uh-uh. We'd better go before you start chasing me around the desk. Good idea. And I know just the place to go. Oh, Mr. Phillips, I was just going to call you. The chief wants to see you. Hmm. I'll see you in a moment, I hope, darling. Take that pat in the back. I'll wait. <laughs> Lips are smudged. Observant chap, aren't you? Yep. Still trying? Uh -huh. Just mental exercise. I'll get it, though. This book here is going to show me how. Codes from Rosetta to Marconi by Inspector Brown. Well, well. <laughs> Tommy! Is it too late to get a book from the library? No, main branch around the corner is open. Good, call investigation and tell them to check on the book for me immediately. Tell them it's for Mr. Phillips, but I want a copy of it and I want to know everybody who took it out in the last few weeks. Well, that should be easy. The file should have that. What's the title of the book? I don't know the title, but the catalog number is CH3PD2. CH3PD2. CH3PD2? What? Hey, that's where I've been. We found it. We found it. Found it. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, wait a minute. $500 bills. Hey, are these things real? What's real? Well, there's five $500 bills and two ones. I know the ones are real, but... $2,502? How did I get... Yes! Tommy, listen, this is terribly important. Tell Mr. Phillips not to leave here until he hears from me. I've just fallen into something. I'll say you have. $2,500 worth. Well, we've really done a remarkable job. We have Reed right where we want him. And this is one time we don't have to worry about a confession. I've already prepared the release papers on Lanning. Poor chap. <laughs> he 
He was so overjoyed at Ross's murderer being caught that he made me a gift of a cigarette holder. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you get the indictment ready, let me check it. Right. Where is Miss Reynolds? In my office? She's gone. And I saw it right in front of my eyes. What are you talking about? She had $2,500 dropped out of her purse. Tommy, I think those books you're reading have gone to your head. Which part are you playing now, Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? There were five $500 bills and two ones. You must be ill. Are you trying to tell me that Miss Reynolds had $2,500? Now, please be calm. I'm always calm, especially when I'm excited. I'm telling you, I saw it right in the front of my eyes. $2,500? Yes, and she said for you to stay here until you heard from her. And another thing, we solved the code. I know I'm hearing what I'm hearing, but I just don't get it. First you tried to tell me that Miss Reynolds had $2,500, and now you're talking about a code. What code? The code on the back of that card that you gave me, and we sent for the book. What book? The code was the, was the number of the book at the library, and we sent for it. Get me it. the Chronicle, quickly. Hello? Oh, hello, Phillips. Jerry? No, she scrammed over to your place when she heard about you grabbing Reed with a corpse beside him. Listen, grab a cab and come right over here. This is very important. I'm practically in the cab now. Hello, sweetheart. What's on your mind? You know, this is the first time you've sent for me since Reynolds joined the staff. Before that, I used to get a story once in a while. I'm worried about Jerry Bates. Oh, what's wrong with her? Outside of the fact that she's a gal that never carries enough dough with her. That's just what I'm worried about. She was supposed to wait for me while I was talking to the DA. Now, Tommy tells me that she flashed a roll of $500 bills and took a run-out powder. $500 bills? Look, Phillips, you're talking about a gal that didn't have enough dough to pay a dinner check. I'm telling you that she flashed a roll of $500 bills. And I'm telling you that she didn't have $6.85. She had to write a check. For $2,500? No, she cashed it at Garrett's place. And Garrett never had $2,500 and he joined at one time. Ten bucks, brother, that's all she got. Where else could she have gotten the money? I'm still telling you the check was for $10. I don't know. I saw her write it. In fact, I tried to cash it for her, so I know. Then you didn't cash it? No. Well, who did? King. King cashed her check? Uh, Garrett. Now, wait a minute, Bates. In your own calm way, and take it easy. Tell me the story right from the beginning. Well, it's very, very simple. I took Jerry out to dinner, and she didn't have enough money to pay the tab, so she wrote a check. Well, I took the check and tried to cash it for her, but the bartender turned me down, so I brought the check back to Jerry. She gave it to King, King took it over to Joe, Joe gave it to Garrick, Garrick cashed it and gave the money to King, and King gave it to Jerry. You gotta admit, that check got a lot of mileage. Did Jerry count the money? No, just because I wanted to borrow a couple of dollars, just to make a very worthwhile investment, she put the dough right in her bag. She's a very selfish dame. Why should Garrick hand out $2,500 for a $10 check? But Garrick didn't even want to cash the check for us. He cashed it for King, didn't he? There's something phony about this, Bates. Sorry, Mr. Phillips, but I didn't get that book. There's only one copy of it, and it's at the East Parkway branch, and it's closed. But we found out the title and the rest of the information. This is almost as bad as who cashed the check. I send you out to find a book. You don't get it, but you find out the title. That's right, sir. We check right through that number, CH3 and PD2. The title of the book is Grace Toxicology, The Study of Poisons and Their Antidotes. Now, the last three people who took it out, believe me, it isn't the best seller either. Never mind that, Collins. Never mind the book review. Go ahead, please. Well, the last three people who took it out were Dr. Harvey Nelson, Thomas Gordon, and Dr. L. Little. Poisons and Gordon. Did you say the East Parkway branch? That's right, sir. Gordon is King's butler. Don't tell me it's the butler. It's always the butler. I've got a couple of calls to make, and the first one is to Garrick. Tommy. If anybody calls, be sure and get the messages straight. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Say, this is getting better and better. Want to listen? When I want to listen to other people's conversations... Say, are you listening to a two-way hookup? Yes, sir. Well, how do you do that telephone trick? Oh, that's easy. I figured it out. I call a fellow in one line and a girl I know in another line. She thinks he called and he thinks she called. Then I listen in. Boy, do I have fun. Can you do that with any two numbers? Sure, if you have a switchboard. Say... If we could get Garrick and King on the phone... That's a great idea. Call Garrick. If he's in, hang up. Then we'll go into our routine. Hurry up. I'm like 8146.
Hello? I'd like to speak to Garrick. Mr. Garrick isn't here. He'll return at 9.30. He'll be back at half past nine. That's only half off. Now we'll wait. Come here. You know, it was the greatest shock to me when I heard that Reed was being held for the murder. He seemed a most uprighteous man. There's an old adage, Mr. King, about a book and it's covered. Yes, that's quite true, isn't it? I suppose Mr. Phillips is quite pleased with his work. I had, I had no idea. I, I, I couldn't have believed that Lanning was innocent, particularly after the way that Mr. Phillips presented his evidence. Or is, is this just another case of his ingenuity, holding one person while he tracks down the other suspect? Oh, no, no, no. Reed is, is absolutely guilty this time. You see, the same poison was used in both instances. Oh, really? That isn't the reason I came here tonight. Oh. Huh. Would this be a social call? Oh, in a way it might be. It also might be the beginning of a very strange story. Tell me, Mr. King, what do you know about Garrick and his restaurant? Garrick? Yes. Pardon me, please. Hello? Hello? Hello, boss? It's working. Oh, I, uh, I didn't have a chance to see you. Uh, I'll stop by another time. Maybe I have some more for you by then. I know 2,500 isn't a lot. But honest, collections are very bad. What do you mean? I'm doing everything I can. But collections getting tougher every day. And 2500 was all the boys turned in. What are you talking about? I mean the money I gave you tonight when you made your call. I never got it. But you sent Joe back with a check to cash it, didn't you? That wasn't for me, that was for the other party. What do you mean? For that girl? Of course. How could you have made a mistake like that? I couldn't help it. I took the check and burned it like you always told me to. But don't worry, I'll find that girl and take care of it. That won't be necessary. Just leave the matter in my hands. What do you mean? You know where she is? Yes, I do. Right here. Collins, get a car. I... Goodbye. Will you pardon me a moment, please? Surely. Yes, Mr. King? Gordon, I'm not to be disturbed. It's not often that someone as charming as Miss Reynolds drops in for a friendly visit. Yes, sir. I understand. Now, uh, just what were we talking about? Well, I asked you what you knew about Garrick and his restaurant. Garrick. Hello, Garrick. This is Gordon. I think you and a couple of the boys should come right over. There's a package here that has to be taken away. Nothing I like better. And uh, one is not apt to be bored by the conversation of one's friends. You know, I find conversation while one is dining, it's, uh, well, it's sort of upsetting. He doesn't make much money in his business, does he? You ask almost as many questions as your friend, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> I didn't really mean to. What's the matter with this crate? Can't you go any faster? Got it all the way down right now, Chief. I can't quite understand why you've taken such a personal interest in my affairs. Well, uh, two reasons, I guess. One, because I'm a woman and I'm curious. The other, because I'm a newspaper woman and I... I thought I smelled a story. I'm sorry I annoyed you, Mr. King. I'll be going. Sit down, Miss Reynolds. What? Sit down. Say, what's the big idea? Before you go, don't you think you should return that money? What money? The money you got by mistake this evening. Then it is your money. Well, I haven't got it. I left it with my city editor. And I told him where I got it, too. It's very unfortunate. You know, I, I regret exceedingly that you've become so interested in my affairs. Knowledge sometimes can be very dangerous. Now, you take Nick Ross. Poor Nick. He knew too much and, well, I couldn't have that. Then you kill Vern Drake, too.
afraid she might talk too much. The only good witness is dead witness. Dead witness can never incriminate you. Want to see Mr. King? Nobody's in. I said I want to see Mr. King. I told you nobody's in. Now listen. What? Jerry! Well, Mr. King, I think you know why I'm here. I heard your conversation with Garrick. Look out, Rod! Get him, Michael! Here they are, Chief. Thanks. Take Mr. King down and book him for murder. Right. And hold the others on a conspiracy charge. Okay, Chief. Get him out of here. Come on. That was a nice shot, Jerry. Hey, you forgot his little dyspepsia pills. Leave those alone, Bates. Why, what's the matter? Look. Oh, so that's where he kept the little fellas. What a story. May I go now, teacher? With pleasure, Bates. Oh, Roger might have been killed. Not with a bodyguard like you around. And now there's no question about it. About what? About your joining my staff permanently. And in a couple of years, we may even discuss your Wednesday night club meetings. Oh, I'll resign from the club. Honeymoon Bridge is much more interesting. <laughs> Do you know what? What? Tommy was right when he said Reed wasn't guilty. Oh, honey. This is no time to discuss Tommy. Come here. <laughs> Come in. Chief. Yes, Tommy, what now? I've solved the Nicross murder. Reed is no more guilty than Lanning is. Then who is guilty? Why, King, Lowell King. And just how did you arrive at that? Simple. He's the only one I didn't suspect. Well, nice work, Tommy. <clears throat> Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Ho, ho, ho. Greetings, Hastings Mystery Theater viewers and subscribers, and welcome to all of our first-time viewers. I'm Dan LeClaire, Program Manager for Hastings Cable Access Channel. We're glad to have you aboard. Please take a minute to check out the links in the description below. There you will find a link to a bonus Hastings Mystery Theater episode, as well as links to our merchandise shop, where you can buy products related to classic movie mystery themed like t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other things. And if you purchase our products, this will help us greatly. This will enable us to continue focusing our efforts on bringing you these great old mystery movies from the 1930s and 40s. Thanks to those of you who have already done so. And also, consider giving us a donation as well. And of course, like and subscribe. And as always, leave us your wonderful comments. All right. surrounded. Then I heard a shot. Then a woman screamed. So you got up, went downstairs, and plugged him. Why didn't you question that niece of his? She'd be a rich woman once he was in his grave. I've taken care of Woody. He's going away. But when I was at the door, I heard my husband's voice inside. Well, where were you then when the shot was fired? I'm holding you here on suspicion of murder. Because if I'd remained on my feet another moment, I'd have killed him. You miserable, ungrateful, treacherous snake, you! You can't prove anything on me. But I can try. You fork over a hundred and fifty thousand, or I'll raise such a filthy row. And why did you push that woman off the bus? Why did you? Why did you? I didn't! 
Keep me out of jail. What was that? Don't go! Don't leave me! What's up? 